This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. The talk is entitled, or the sort of the, the I, th I think uh, the first half of the, the title may have gotten truncated somehow. So originally the, the title of the talk, uh, or uh, was supposed to be, that's okay, is Belief in God Rational? So at least that's the question that I want to address. Um, and I think faith and reason in the life of John Henry Newman help us address that. Um, but, uh, but sort of the framing question is, is belief in God rational? Um, let me offer just a, a quick um, kind of prefatory word. Um, in the talk, I'm not going to talk much about faith as a gift of grace or faith as a theological virtue. Um, I'm going to explore faith and reason as movements of the intellect and the will. The question of the rationality of faith as it appears in our society in the wake of the Enlightenment. Um, that's the question context in which Newman is thinking about this, but I'm not going to talk about kind of faith in medieval scholasticism or, you know, how what John Henry Newman says squares with what Thomas Aquinas says on faith. I don't think there's much of a contradiction. There's a couple of places where I might touch on the question of, of grace and how faith works um, with respect to grace. Um, but I'm, I'm mainly interested today in talking about Kind of how it is that people that that people maybe from the beginning of life have faith in God or in a particular creed um, or come to have faith along the way, um, and why that's not something that's just kind of crazy or or irrational. Um, why that's something that actually makes sense. Um, so, spoiler alert: the question right is is belief in God rational? I think the answer to that question is yes. Um, uh, belief in God or in anything else is an act of the will and the intellect together. Um, I also want to note from the outset that I'm going to use faith and belief pretty much interchangeably. Um, so don't let that confuse you. Um, on the one hand, faith in God or in anything else is an act of trust um, in a source of truth or uh, trust in uh, a, a particular belief say trust trust that it's true um, by faith the intellect accepts claims about truth that the intellect doesn't necessarily see by its own lights and those claims about truth then form the foundation on which we can reason to new conclusions um, on the other hand faith is itself an act of reason and the reasoning of faith we could say proceeds from grounds different from those that strict rational deduction would demand. And although such reasons lack the clarity of a mathematical proof, the intellect can see their truth on different grounds. Thus, when we examine faith with reason, we find that it accords with reason. It might be right or it might be wrong, but having faith in God is not illogical or irrational. So the best account that I know of of how faith and reason work together um, and of the way in which belief in God is rational um, and also just more generally the way our hearts and minds operate when it comes to our deepest convictions, religious or otherwise, is that found in Cardinal Newman's uh, 15 sermons preached before the University of Oxford, um, which is a, a book you can easily find on Amazon. Also, if you go to a website, newmanreader.org, you can find the complete works of Cardinal Newman um, collected there. And that's super, super useful. Um, uh, uh, so I highly recommend that, newmanreader.org, if you want to read more about Newman. Um, I think it's kind of fitting that Newman is really, really helpful for this because Newman is most famous as a convert, as a man of faith, <clears throat> whose reasoning drives him to give up his career and the ties that he has to his family and friends and to become the church, a member of a church that he had despised for a long time. And Newman sees his own reasoning as being a matter of kind of reasoning according to probabilities and principles of religion. And I'll talk about how that, um, kind of what he means by that. So the, the things that we're going to hear tonight are things that actually have an impact on Newman's life. They're, they're, they're a kind of a sketch of how he thinks faith works that he offers years before 
he actually proceeds in this way to completely change his life. Um, so it, it's kind of his abstract, you know, this is how I think the human condition is, but it's also in some way it ends up being autobiographical. I don't think he knows that at the time he writes it, it's going to be autobiographical, but it kind of ends up being autobiographical. So just to give a little bit of background about Newman, because I, I think I, I want to make a couple of connections to his life along the way. Uh, Newman was born in 1801 into a, a kind of typical bourgeois English family. His father was a banker in London. Um, and at 15, he had a kind of spiritual awakening or, or a conversion to a, a Calvinist evangelical Christianity. He had a keen sense of the reality and the majesty of God and of his own spiritual unworthiness. Um, in due course, Newman uh, went to Oxford. He became an Anglican priest, uh, a tutor at Oriel College in Oxford, and eventually the vicar of St. Mary's, which was the university church in Oxford, right there on Oxford's main street. He quickly entered into the religious and political controversies of his time, and he became a nationally known figure. Um, he helped lead the Oxford movement, which emphasized the Catholic roots of the Church of England, advocated a revival of traditional liturgy, and argued that Anglicanism stood as a kind of middle way between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. Uh, but Newman's study of the church fathers and also kind of watching events play out in the Anglican church around him led him to believe that Anglicanism was inconsistent with the historic understanding of authority in the church. So when Newman, for example, read about the controversies with the Arians, he all of a sudden saw that he himself stood out of communion with the authoritative body of the church that if that controversy had played out in his time, he was analogous to the Arians. He wasn't analogous to someone like Athanasius. Um, so this ends up being kind of troubling and part of one of the catalysts um, for him to enter the Roman Catholic Church um, with great sacrifice. Um, but it was a move that he said was a move out of shadows and images and into the truth. He ended up founding the English congregations of, of oratorians in Birmingham and London, uh, among other institutions. Uh, and he continued to write on many subjects, uh, most famously his, his books, The Idea of a University, The Grammar of Ascent, um, and his autobiography, The Apologia Pro Vita Sua. And I'd add here that what we're going to talk about today is in some ways a really helpful background for The Grammar of Ascent. So if, what is a, if you're interested in this topic and you want to pursue it more, of course, turn to the university sermons, but you can also turn to the grammar of ascent. He was made a cardinal by Pope Leo XIII and died a few years later um, in 1890. So the university sermons that I'm going to talk about this evening were given formally 10 times a year um, by a clergyman selected especially for the occasion. So they're more like kind of a, a set of lectures than they are regular Sunday sermons in a church. In Sermon 10, University Sermon 10, Newman sets out to distinguish faith and reason. And he starts with kind of the popular conception of faith and reason. What most people, especially most kind of educated, probably slightly skeptical people at his time, think about faith and reason. Um, so in the popular conception of reason, he writes, reason requires strong evidence before it assents, and faith is content with weaker evidence. When then faith and reason are contrasted together, faith means a kind of easiness, reason a difficulty of conviction. Reason is called either strong sense or skepticism according to the bias of the speaker, and faith either teachableness or credulity. So why does faith settle for evidence that is not as rigorous as reason? Because, Newman says, faith is influenced by previous notices, prepossessions, and in a good sense of the word, prejudices, but reason by direct and definite proof. Now, this isn't because Newman thinks faith is weak or foolish, um, but because he sees faith as a principle of action. And he says, action does not allow time for minute and finished investigations. Um, 
Now, it seems like this is kind of a self-defeating argument, right? For a religious person to argue that faith is based on presumption or prejudice or all the things that faith is supposed to be, you know, that, that people who hate faith claim faith is, right? Um, but Newman doesn't think that this is the case, right? Newman thinks that actually presumption, prepossessions, um, previous notices, prejudices, that this is how the great majority of people who believe in religion, that this is actually how they believe, right? That people don't believe because they've weighed a lot of evidences, because they sat down and kind of wrote out the pros and cons on one side of a sheet of paper and on the other side. Um, they believe because of a spontaneous movement of their heart, right? Um, their faith might be strengthened by apologetic arguments or reasoning, um, but it doesn't primarily depend on them, right? Their faith is also more personal. It's more living than arguments can create. Um, and Newman thinks, look, we might prefer that it be otherwise. We might prefer that human nature be different than that. Um, but this is actually how faith functions for most people, right? And if you go into many churches, you'll see that that's, that's abundantly the case, right? People who walk into churches and, and light candles, people you find, you know, praying rosaries after a daily mass, they're not there because somebody gave them like an argument. And, and, and it was the argument that convinced them that they should be there praying the rosary, lighting the candle, right? Um, something else is going on. And that's especially the case, right, because faith is encompasses, faith is something that educated people have, that people who are extremely highly trained intellectually have, but it's also something that people with varying intellectual abilities have, right? People who aren't just rich and well-educated, but who are poor, who are not as educated. Um, people who are children or people who are just really busy, right? They don't have time to, to weigh and do arguments and do a lot of reading. They have faith. And so we need an account of faith in which evidence and argument aren't just its foundation, right? Otherwise, we're not giving an account of um, this, this as a human phenomenon. I think that this also kind of works well for other forms of faith, not just religious faith, right? So if we think about our own lives, right? Collecting evidence, investigating claims, and weighing different pros and cons are all good, but at some point we have to get on with life, right? Since the Enlightenment, some people in our society have held up, and we almost have this as a kind of instinct, right? There's an instinct that reason is an exclusive ideal, that the ideal human being is supposed to do, is supposed to operate on reason alone, do all his or her thinking in a box, only accept what can be proved rationally based on solid evidence of the empirical world as we sense and experience it. But of course, th this isn't actually how we work, right? It's not how human beings work. It's not how we found, it's not how kind of our thinking works, our rational arguments work. And so faith, one of the, one of the I think, key things about faith is that it's the faculty that lets us trust certain sources and believe what they have to say, without thoroughly investigating or thinking the matter through ourselves. But as, as we're going to continue to explore, that act of, of trust or faith um, isn't necessarily a matter of, matter of just abdicating investigation, abdicating thinking, right? We, can ha we have reasons for why we think such an act of faith is rational. So Newman expands this um, distinction between faith and reason into a fuller definition of faith in his sermon, uh, in which he, number 12, which he entitles, Love the Safeguard of Faith Against Superstition, um, which is kind of surprising, right? Isn't the safeguard against superstition reason? We'll come back to that later. But I want to I put it out there that that title is deliberately provocative, right? How is it that love safeguards us from irrationality? What does he mean by that? That's where we're headed. So Newman thinks that faith is distinguished from knowledge because we know something when we have ascertained it by the natural methods given us for ascertaining it. So we know mathematical truths from proofs, right? We know material things from our senses. We know things that we have see, not seen or experienced. Maybe we know about places we haven't been, or we know about historical events before our time from the testimony of others. When we believe in something on the basis 
of such evidence were said to believe on the basis of reason, right? So the exercise of reason itself is, Newman says, uh, or sorry, the exercise of, by the exercise of reason itself is properly meant any process or act of the mind by which from knowing one thing, it advances on to know another, whether it be true or false reason, whether it proceed from antecedent probabilities by demonstration or on evidence. So, right, reason basically asserts X in light of Y. When it's exercised rightly, it leads to true knowledge and apprehension of the world. When it exercised wrong, it's exercised wrongly, it leads to mere opinion and error. So faith and reason, Newman says, are not opposed mental actions, but a similar intellectual act operating on different grounds. Um, and I hope you have a handout for some of the longer quotations I wanted us to unpack. Um, I, I, uh, I sent along a handout. So this is quote one on your handout. Newman writes, faith then and reason are properly contrasted with one another. Faith consisting of certain exercises of reason, which proceed mainly on presumption, and reason of certain exercises which proceed mainly upon proof. Reason makes the particular fact which is to be ascertained the point of primary importance, contemplates it, inquires into its evidence, not of course excluding antecedent considerations, but not beginning with them. Faith, on the other hand, begins with its own previous knowledge and opinions, advances and decides upon antecedent probabilities, that is, on grounds which do not reach so far as to touch precisely the desired conclusion, though they do tend towards it and may come very near it. It acts before actual certainty or knowledge on grounds which, for the most part, near as they come, yet in themselves stand clear of the definite thing which is its object. Hence, it is said, and rightly, to be a venture, involve a risk, or again, to be against reason, to triumph over reason, to surpass or outstrip reason, to attain what reason falls short of, to affect what reason finds beyond its powers, or again, to be a principle above or beyond argument, not to be subject to the rules of argument, not capable of defending itself, to be illogical and the like. So this passage has a, a number of core ideas that we're going to return to, so I want to unpack it a bit. What Newman is saying is that reason as I said, reason is an exercise of the mind by which we move from X premise or X evidence to Y conclusion. And for reason broadly conceived, right, this means moving from some kind of proven empirical evidence or evidence that's come from a, a separate proof that you've done to a theoretical conclusion. However, faith reasons not from direct empirical evidence placed before us, but from grounds of trust or probability. Right, This concept of antecedent probabilities is really important for him. It's at the heart of his concept of faith. So an antecedent probability might be something like, given the trustworthiness of this source, or given the nature of X, it's likely that Y is the case, right? I, I can't give a, a, a mathematical, you know, I can't draw like a straight line, but it's pretty likely that this is the case, right? You know, and so faith reasons from these grounds of trust or probability, right? So that's why we might say, look, I, I, I believe this thing because the people that I trust in life generally told it to me, right? They taught it to me. My mother taught me my faith, you might say, um, or someone who I know is a really good person. Why, why are they a good person? I want to know more about what, um, what makes them tick, Right. Those are kind of the probabilities that lead us in, that begin to incline us um, in, in a particular direction, or that cause us to actually make an act of faith in something as they get stronger and stronger, right? I believe that, you know, th this particular moral principle is to because good people think this way. Um, or someone might say, look, I've actually seen miracles. I've seen things in my life that I don't think can be explained naturally this looks like a miracle, or I'm reading about a miracle here, so I'm inclined to think that it's happened, right? That that's miraculous. Now, probabilities, of course, and are kind of the way by which we judge something as probable, isn't reducible to a particular scientific standard, right? But to the moral temperament of each individual, you have to have a rightly disposed mind 
in order to weigh probabilities, in order to judge probabilities rightly. So faith isn't something that people possess or lack by happenstance, right? It's not like there's a gene for faith. Some people have it, some people don't. Um, or because, um, you know, sorry, so it's not because of happenstance or randomness or genetic makeup, but Newman thinks we have faith in, in a good part because of our likes and our dislikes, what we hope for, our opinions. Um, right, and I wanna come back to that idea that Newman talks about faith as a matter of action, right? Newman, if Newman thinks that faith requires action before all of its conclusions are proven to the same degree that rational conclusions can be proven, right? And it, and it may be that all the conclusions of faith will never be proven. Um, this is, on the one hand, why, re why faith can make conclusions that pure reason can't, but it's also why faith remains a risk and we'll talk in a little bit about how Newman thinks that faith is kind of an indicator of the state of our heart, that it's an action for which we can be held accountable. Faith as a kind of reasoning based on presumption also makes sense somewhat along these lines of the popular notion that faith is the test of a person's heart or a person's character, right? And it makes sense of the fact that different people can accept or reject conclusions about the same fact when they hear it. Um, so this is now where we're going to explore quotation two on your handout. Newman writes, it's commonly and truly said that faith is a test of a man's heart. Now, what does this really mean, but that it shows what he thinks likely to be? And what he thinks likely depends surely on nothing else than the general state of his mind, the state of his convictions, feelings, tastes, and wishes. A fact is asserted and is thereby proposed to the acceptance or rejection of those who hear it. Each hearer will have his own view concerning it prior to the evidence. This view will result from the character of his mind, nor commonly will it be reversed by any ordinary variation in the evidence. If he is indisposed to believe, he will explain away very strong evidence. If he is disposed, he will, um, he will accept very weak evidence. On the one hand, he will talk of it being safer to, it's being the safer side to believe. On the other hand, that he does not feel that he can go so far as to close with what is offered him. That the evidence is something and not everything, that it tells a certain way, yet might be more, he will hold in either case, he will hold in either case, but then follows the question, what is to come of the evidence being what it is? And this is what he decides according to what he call what is called the state of his heart. So Newman qualifies, right, that there, there might be evidence that can convince someone one way or the other um, against his will, but evidence for or against religion usually isn't of this kind of overpowering nature. Now, Newman isn't a relativist about religious truth. He doesn't think that all truth claims are equal or that are lacking in evidence. Um, that might make some more true than others. But Newman thinks um, that most people decide by the, make decisions about faith by the principles of thought and conduct that are habitual to them, right? Um, we might be rational actors, you could say, but we're biased rational actors. The dispositions of our heart govern our judgment of religion. So if you hear that 100 years ago, World War I ended, um, unless you really have strong grounds for skepticism about the existence of World War I, to my knowledge, there are no World War I skeptics. Um, if, if, you, if you hear of any, let me know. Um, right? You're, you're probably not going to quarrel with that. But if you hear that at a place in Portugal 100 years ago, uh, the sun stood still and spun around, right? which Catholics believe, many Catholics it's not an article of the faith, but generally speaking, Catholics believe happened at Fatima, right? You'll decide whether or not that's likely to be true relative to your existing convictions, feelings, probabilities about religion. Now, of course, Newman says, look, the same is true of unbelief as of faith, right? So it's not as though people who don't believe are kind of more rational than the credulous believers. Um, and that's where we get to quotation three on your handout, right? 
as faith may be viewed as opposed to reason in the popular sense of the world, it must not be overlooked that unbelief is opposed to reason also. Unbelief indeed considers itself especially rational or critical of evidence, but it criticizes the evidence of religion only because it does not like it and really goes upon presumptions and prejudices as much as faith does only of an opposite nature, right? Only presumptions of an opposite nature. It considers a religious system so improbable that it will not listen to evidence of it, or if it listens, it employs itself in doing what a believer could do if he chose quite as well, which what he is quite as well aware can be done, it is in showing that the evidence might be more complete and unexceptionable than it is. On this account, it is that all believers call themselves rational. All, oh, sorry, on this account, it is that unbelievers call themselves rational, not because they decide by evidence, but because after they have made their decision, they merely occupy themselves in sifting it. The unbeliever's disposition against faith closes him off to its possibility. Oh, sorry, sifting it, period. <clears throat> right. So Newman says the unbeliever's disposition against faith closes him off to its possibilities, not on purely rational grounds, but because of the nexus of, a, of opposite prejudices and probabilities from those of the believer. So at, at this point, you might say, like, look, isn't faith, isn't, isn't this just kind of a matter of like weak or deficient reasoning? Maybe believers and unbelievers engage in it too. <clears throat> but isn't this, doesn't that just mean that we're all in some ways guilty of irrationality? Newman doesn't think so. Um, he thinks that faith is an exercise of the re uh, is in in a way the exercise of reason that's actually reasonable, right? Why might it actually be reasonable? So Newman says, look, people make different rational deductions from the same set of facts. They might have uh, different probabil sort of different probabilities. Um, they might be inclined in different ways but they can look at the same sky and think that the weather will be good or bad or see the same action and think that it's either brave or foolish um, in part because there are good reasons for each conclusion, right? So this phenomenon doesn't show that we're irrational beings, right? It just shows uh, because if we were irrational beings, right, we would just come to completely different conclusions. Um, instead, Newman think, says, what it shows is that we form schools of thought, right? We form parties. We, we, we sort of, it shows in short that our reason isn't, it's not that it operates incorrectly. It's just that it operates never alone, right? Um, or it never operates alone. Let me phrase that better. Our reason is always dependent for its exercise, for helping us get to right conclusions. It's always dependent on those antecedent probabilities and, and dispositions. So he says, whether we consider processes of faith or other exercises of reason, men advance forward on grounds which they do not or cannot produce, or if they could, yet could not prove to be true on latent or antecedent grounds which they take for granted. So the question then is not whether or not we have faith, but in what we have faith or whom we have faith, why we have faith. Um, what is it that makes up that nexus of convert of beliefs and probabilities um, that we have? What has determined that for us? Newman kind of explores how it is that we know things in this kind of conjectural or probabilistic way um, a bit more in the following lines. Right. He observes that reasoning about higher or more speculative things further beyond our like what we can immediately perceive requires reasoning with less sure evidence. Right. So it's very easy to make sure, you know, uh, arguments in physics about what happens when I throw a ball from here to there. It's much less easy to make arguments about string theory and multiverses. Right. Those are going to be more conjectural, more open to debate and dispute. They proceed from less sure and less certain evidence. So if that's the case um, in these other areas of human knowledge, it makes sense that religious faith, which is a matter of a sort of the most speculative thinking that human beings can do, the most metaphysical thinking human beings can do, 
that religious faith involves evidence, but not kind of uh, evidence that is as concrete and evident um, and totally certain um, as things like, you know, Euclidean geometry. Um, so Newman kind of posits as a law that according to its desirableness, whether in point of excellence or range or intricacy, so is the subtlety of the evidence on which it is received, right? Um, that doesn't mean that we can't successfully reason and think about speculative matters, either in physics or theology, um, but it does mean that it's going to be more difficult and it's going to be contested. Newman also notes that this matter of kind of how we know based on presuppositions and, and presumptions, how we kind of string together conclusions based on this, that we, we see this not only in kind of like matters of speculative physics, but in other areas. And he talks about people um, who can come to right conclusions by reasoning so complex that we would have to take them on faith until more apparent evidence confirms their theories, right? His example of this, which is something, those of you who've read War and Peace, which is incidentally a really fun book, it looks like a doorstop, but it actually like, there's a reason why uh, people say that, uh, why people have loved it throughout the centuries. So plug for War and Peace as well. Um, right? In War and Peace, Tolstoy talks about great generals and tacticians like Napoleon who can ascertain the outcomes of battles or particular military strategies based on, on the basis of slight indications, right? And so imagine you're standing next to Napoleon on a hill overlooking the battlefield, right? Napoleon's genius is that he can look, scan the battlefield, know his terrain and his enemy, and know with almost a sixth sense the outcome of the battle and how he's going to win it. Now, if you went to Napoleon and said, okay, uh, you think that you're going to win by moving these cannons here and moving this troops here and by doing X, Y, or Z other things or waiting for the enemy to make a mistake in this way, why do you think that? Prove to me why it is that you're going to win this battle, right? New, Napoleon isn't going to write you <laughs> an ironclad proof. He would indicate kind of a web. It would be like a web of ideas spun out of, out of his own experience, out of his intuitions, out of things he thinks is probable based on this other thing that happened, based on a thing he heard about the, you know, the German forces here. But at the end of the day, right, Napoleon can be accurately predicting what's going to happen, right? That web of probabilities is actually going to pan out, right? And so Newman thinks that this is kind of the way that true religious faith operates in the mind of the believer, that supernatural grace gives our uncultivated reason or, or kind of over time gives it and, and opens it to a correct set of probabilities and impressions such that a person can correctly assent to religious doctrines and religious authorities. Now, in his book, The Grammar of Assent, which I, I mentioned earlier, Newman will describe this mode of making judgments based on probabilities. He calls this the illative sense. Um, and he says that the illative sense operates in a manner analogous to phrenesis or prudence in the thought of Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas, right? So those of you who've studied Aristotle or those of you who've studied Aquinas, you know that phronesis helps us choose the right course of action based on the evidence set before us. It helps regulate the other virtues, right? It's what helps us judge, okay, in this situation, the brave course of action is this, whereas the foolhardy course of action is this, and the cowardly course of action is this, right? And that's in some ways determined on intuitions in the practicalities of the moment, right? So in, the same, in an analogous way, the illative sense supplements our logical deduction by making judgments based on a constellation of facts, experiences, previous judgments, um, presumptions, et cetera.
right? So um, in episode 20 of the Aquinas 101 series, if any of you are, are like real hardcore groupies of the Thomistic Institute and watch all the videos, uh, Father James Brent talks about the illet of sense as that faculty that kind of helps you understand that your friend is feeling sad or sick or under the weather or something's wrong because of her facial expressions and social cues, right? It's something that allows you to kind of inf make inferences and judgments based on a constellation of, of things, right? The illet of sense also helps a historian determine what probably happened in history when we need to infer a broad story from a single data point. It tells us whether or not something rings true, and it rings true whether or not, you know, sort of it rings true because it accords with other reasoning, other judgments that we've made. Now, Newman offers a second analogy um, between moral actions and inferences of faith, right? Or, or he might say, look, if in some ways faith operates similarly to phrenesis, making judgments kind of based on the, the things that you can perceive, even if they're not sort of 100% rational deductive, uh, rationally deductive judgments. Newman says, here's another analogy between moral actions and inferences of faith, right? Great objects require um, great means to attain them. So it takes great courage to fight and win a hard battle. It takes if we're talking about the Napoleonic Wars, it takes a Nelson to win a Trafalgar. And similarly, um, the Christian faith is kind of a grand adventure, right? We have to risk superstition and false conclusion. We risk the prospect of that it could all be wrong in order to attain the union with God that is the great end goal of faith. Um, but Newman thinks that the greatness of the object of faith, the greatness of God, should spur us on to make that costly risk, to make that act of faith. And perhaps the greatest model of risky faith, right, is St. Is Peter. Um, after all, Peter is the one who follows Christ eagerly after meeting him with little reflection. And yet in 1 Peter 3.15, we find the famous verse, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be always ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give an answer for the reason of the hope that, to give a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, right? So Newman says, wait a minute, Peter himself has faith without a lot of reflection, but here in 1 Peter we find, always be ready to give an account of your faith. So Newman says, well, this isn't really that much of a paradox. True faith needs grounds for faith and it needs an object of faith but we can further reflect on and examine them, right? Um, we continue to ponder over the reasons for the faith that we have, the reasons for the judgments that we have. Now, there are some people who don't, right? But, but it, it's very common to, to do this. So Newman writes, all men have a reason, but not all men can give a reason. Now, Newman then goes on to investigate the way in which we think about theological arguments about some of the reasons that we might give, right? And what he calls the evidences of Christianity, right? And, and he has in mind, especially um, a book by an Anglican clergyman named William Paley, right? Who made the famous argument um, that God's design was manifestly visible in creation, that the orbit of the planets resembles the years of a watch that God is called the divine watchmaker. Um, Newman thinks it's understandable that defenders of Christianity would turn to arguments like this, um, but he thinks that um, it's not, it's, it's, they're kind of not the real reasons that people commonly believe, uh, right? Um, and so he thinks that those arguments can help form or shape our beliefs. They might be something that we think back on as we review, is it, you know, are we believing for, a rational reason. Um, uh, but he doesn't think that they're going to be kind of knockdown arguments um, that can substitute for that complex collection of loves, other reasons, previous judgments that we've made um, by which we believe what we believe.
So we're, we're getting um, towards the end here and I'm, I'm hoping to wrap up in a couple minutes and then we can have as much time for uh, questions as, as you'd like. Um, so Newman thinks, look, if arguments are helpful for kind of clarifying our beliefs and ratifying them or helping us to modify them, but if they only have so much persuasive power, what can keep our faith from going bad? What is it that helps us be faithful, but not superstitious, prejudiced in a good way, but not prejudiced in a bad way, right? Or, or sort of what, what gear, what, how can we train our illative sense well to make good judgments about these things? Newman says that instinctively we follow John Locke and that other enlightenment thinkers and claim that reason is the thing that safeguards us against these kind of bad prejudices, these bad antecedent probabilities. People who hold this view would say something like this, right? They would say the young, the poor, the ignorant, those whose reason is undeveloped, those are people who are victims of excessive faith. But if we educate them, if we open their minds, help them in, um, reflect, compare and investigate, um, if we draw their attention to the evidences of Christianity, we're kind of leading them to the right path and we're keeping them from being too superstitious, right? Being, um, being, um, being prejudiced in a bad way. Now, Newman is all in favor of education, right? But he notes that the Bible doesn't counsel us to use reason to purify our faith, right? Jesus says he's the good shepherd, that he knows his sheep, his sheep know them by his voice. But Jesus doesn't say anything about the sheep kind of reasoning <laughs> to, uh, to a particular conclusion, right? The sheep respond not because of an argument, but because of love. Um, so Newman argues that the safeguard of faith is a right state of heart. It is holiness or dutifulness or the new creation or the spiritual mind, however we word it, which is the quickening and illuminating principle of true faith, giving it ha eyes, hands, and feet. It is love which forms it out of the rude chaos into the in image of Christ or in scholastic language, justifying faith or in scholastic language, justifying faith is fides formata caritate, faith formed by love. It is the new life and not the natural reason which leads, leads the soul to Christ. So this is in some ways coming back to how faith and love go together, how saving faith is a gift of love um, that comes from God. It comes from feelings, affections, inclinations enkindled by God's grace that make us think that certain evidence is sufficient, even if we don't have a complete proof, um, that moves us to make an act of, of the will that trusts in God. And so faith, Newman says, proceeds from our moral state, even more than our intellectual state. As I said, it remains a principle of action, but it becomes perfected by obedience. It acts, he writes, because it is faith, but the direction, firmness, consistency, and precision of its acts, it gains from love. Let me make just a, a couple of observations in conclusion, right? So if, if Newman is right about this, um, we should use our reason to examine the principles or sort of to, to examine the things that we believe by faith. We should be prepared to give an account of what we believe and why. Um, but we should also ask who or what we're obeying. Who or what is forming our will? What do we think is probable? How have we come to that conclusion? What do we love? What do we worship? Because those things are going to shape our reasoning, right? Those things will direct what we reason about and how we reason. They'll provide the lenses through which we see the world. Uh, so a, a friend of mine, the political theorist, Matthew Frank, says that we need to examine our prejudices to make sure that they're worth keeping, right? Not because we should discard everything that we, that we presume or prejudge, um, but because those are gonna be the things that direct our, our, our our further reasoning. Or in the words of a scholar named Thomas Norris, kind of summarizing Newman's view, the kind of person one is determines what one seeks and accepts. When we think about 
the nuns, right? The people who say that they belong to no religious group, that they're spiritual or non-religious. I think Newman, for the reasons I've outlined in this talk, would balk at, at that idea, right? He would question whether many nuns are, are kind of committed, genuine skeptics, or whether they're atheists of convenience or apathy, right? He would question whether being a nun really means that you'd like to believe of, in a God of your own making on your own terms. And he would think that something like that has nothing to do with the gravity and reality of evil, um, that it reduces God to an emotional force field, that it anesthetizes us against the dilemma of being uh, kind of the dilemmas of the human condition um, rather than resolving them. And Newman would urge us to resist that a, a kind of moral numbness. He would want us to strive toward moral and spiritual greatness. His own life gives us the example of following the logic of arguments, the logic of antecedent probabilities to their conclusions and acting on them. He would say that the things in which we have faith can't be things that we've kind of made on our own, meanings that we've given us, given ourselves rather, that we should have faith in transcendent sources of meaning. Um, and that's where I want to kind of take us to the final conclusion of your handout, right? Um, against the kind of common idea that we can make our own religion, right? That we can sort of give ourselves meaning, that the question of meaning in our lives spurs us on to trust in, in sources of authority outside of ourselves. So I, I wanted to end here along these lines with a quote from Benedict XVI, right? Benedict talks about Christian faith as the finding of a you that upholds me and amid all the unfulfilled and in the last resort unfulfillable hope of human encounters gives me the promise of an indestructible love that not only longs for eternity, but also guarantees it. Christian faith lives on the discovery that not only is there such a thing as objective meaning, but that this meaning knows me and loves me that I can entrust myself to it like the child who knows that everything he may be wondering about is safe in the you of his mother. Thus, in the last analysis, believing, trusting, and loving are one. And all these theses around which belief resolves are only concrete expressions of the all-embracing about turn, of the assertion, I believe in you, of the discovery of God in the countenance of the man Jesus of Nazareth. So Newman himself made that act of faith in the person of Jesus Christ as proclaimed by the Catholic Church. For him, faith was not just a, a matter of kind of a series of principles, but it was a matter of persons, of Christ and the bishops that he appointed through time. His journey out of images and shadows into the truth meant giving up his work as an Oxford tutor and an Anglican priest it meant sacrificing his respectability and suffering the rejection of his family and friends. But in the end, it was a price worth paying for a life lived in the truth, a life of right faith formed by right love. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Um, and please, uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. And if you wanna stick around for another 10 minutes, 20, 30, whatever is, whatever is good for you, I'm here. Was that a question about, is, does Newman think that there's a kind of moral deficiency in unbelievers? Yeah. I think the short answer to that is basically yes. Um, <laughs> or or that, that Newman is, uh, Newman is in some ways throwing down a gauntlet um, to some of his, uh, to some of his colleagues, I assume, and, and other kind of prominent people in, um, uh, in England at his time, and he was he was sort of a, a punchy arguer. I mean, I, I think Newman, yeah, New, Newman would have strong questions for why someone doesn't believe, especially because Newman would think that unbelief partly results in many cases from not wanting there to be a God, right? And there are philosophers so, so, so there maybe there maybe new, we could make a distinction between two kinds of unbelief, right? One kind of unbelief might be, you know, I wish there were a God, but I, I just don't see how there can be a good God with so much suffering in the world, 
there are other people who will say, as I believe the philosopher Thomas Nagel, who in other respects kind of comes really close to belief. Thomas Nagel thinks that scientific materialism uh, is completely reductive and untrue. Um, he thinks that everything can't just be reduced to matter and motion. But Thomas Nagel is very upfront about the fact that part of the reason he doesn't believe in God is because he doesn't want there to be a God. Um, so the, the thing that comes back to me when I, when I think about Newman on, on this kind of thing is the X-Files, right? And the X-Files slogan, I want to believe. Um, if the X-Files is a little dated for you, I'm sorry, I'm in my mid thirties. That means that I'm beginning to get old and my pop culture references are, are kind of from my, te you know, high school years are toast. Um, but, but, um, but Newman would ask someone like that, okay, why is it that you don't want to believe? Um, and, and is that something connected to your moral life? Now, I'm, I, I would add just sort of stepping in here, and I think, I don't think what I'm saying is contrary to anything that Newman says, right? Or I, th I think that Newman would agree with me. We also know that people can kind of desire to believe or hold their religious convictions, even good and true religious convictions, for sort of, if not for immoral reasons, then they can wed their religious convictions to um, to hatred or malice or jealousy or whatever. Um, so I think the, one of the things that I find is kind of a challenge um, for for Newman is a kind of not only re-examining why we believe, but how we believe it. Um, yeah. Other questions? Would you clarify on whether or not sort of reason is usually not the underpinning of like of convincing someone of unbelief to believe? With so uh, usually an argument isn't necessarily the thing that brings them around. Is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. So let me put it this way. So Newman would say it, and and I think he's right about this that the that the, the, you know, the reason a person doesn't believe may have something to do with rational arguments, but it probably has to do with the things that they think are probable, with the things that they actually desire, with kind of, as, as I've been, I've tried to use different words to capture it, but that, that constellation of, of probabilities, loves, um, prejudices um, that they have, and so Newman thinks, look, giving someone, giving someone reasons can be helpful, right? And, and I think I know of situations in my life where it's been helpful. Um, but more has to happen, right? I, I, my sense is that there are, there are many people who have intellectual conversions to Catholicism, which I myself had. Um, there are there are some, there are people who have that. There are many people who convert because they kind of come in and are overwhelmed by the power of the mass one day, or they look at someone like mother Teresa and they say, how can her life, they're sort of inspired by her goodness. And that's what leads them along. Not necessarily like an argument that they had with their friend at the end of which their friend said, Oh yeah, like I believe in God or, or, or at the end of which they said, Oh yeah, okay. I see your point. I believe in God. So I think that, Evidences and, 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 and arguments are really important. They're really helpful. Um, but they're not the only thing in, in part because while, you're, while someone's reasoning is um, while someone's reasoning is sifting and sorting through that argument, um, their reasoning is connected to those, loves, affections, dispositions, you know, it's either sort of the lens through which they're weighing the evidence or to give another cultural reference from the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, it's sort of like in my big fat Greek wedding where the, the mother says, you know, uh, like, of course, my husband is the head of the household, but I'm the neck and the neck turns the head, right? Newman would say like, yeah, we reason with our heads, but the things that are, the things that we love, 
and the kind of the disposition of our will and our character, that in some ways is the neck. And that's that can govern and shape, that can turn, I should say, and shape our reasoning. Um, which is why, you know, the love that you show your friend and the sort of the acts of kindness and friendship over the years or bringing a friend to the beauty of the mass is, is kind of just as important in, in a person's conversion. And why ultimately when people convert, you know, usually there are reasons along the way, but ultimately in many cases, it remains kind of a, a mystery. There's, there is something mysterious about it because, because it's sort of the, the things that you presume to be true have shifted. And that is a matter of rational judgment, but it's also a matter of, of the heart and affections. Yeah. Other, other questions? And of course, if, if you, for some reason, feel like I haven't answered your question, just tell me that and poke at me and I'll, I'll give it another shot. Other questions? Uh, so presumably you that like sometimes we have to reserve judgment or <clears throat> okay sorry presumably Newman would agree that sometimes we might have to reserve judgment and not like commit to one side or the other yep. the sense. Um, but I guess we, this might be general but like does he have a system or like anything I guess to distinguish between when we should assent and when we should maybe reserve judgment or hold back Great question. So this is a question that comes up repeatedly in Newman's life and in different contexts. It comes up in these questions kind of of, you could say like, if you wanted to deploy fancy <laughs> vocabulary, religious epistemology, like how do we know matters about God? How do we make acts of faith? What's going on in our head as we do this? But this question becomes really important also in Newman's life when he starts e examining conscience, right? Um, and when he thinks about uh, things like different controversies in the church, um, Newman famously thinks that it's a bad idea for the first Vatican council to make a dogmatic definition about papal infallibility. And then the second, the first Vatican Council makes a dogmatic definition about papal infallibility. And so Newman basically says, okay, well, I, I assent to this. But he would say that kind of the grounds, that there, that there are grounds of authority and credibility that would lead you to believe, that would lead you to make particular acts of assent. Um, and that if those are not in place, then it probably makes sense to reserve judgments about them, right? So if um, if all of a sudden the Council of Bishops and the Pope make uh, make a firm dogmatic declaration about something that you think is kind of up in the air that you've heretofore reserved judgment on, well, it makes sense to him if you trust them as sources of, of authority and religious truth to make that judgment now. Um, but it's not something, you know, or, or to sort of say, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of take it on faith that this is true. And I'm going to sort of be open to understanding more why and how it's true. Yeah, it, it would probably be a matter of what are the conclusions that you've reasoned to beforehand? What's the trustworthiness or, or the authority of, of this source? Um, and those are the things that kind of help help guide us to making right a sense. Um, as, a, as kind of a coda to that, um, I think that that approach is generally helpful, especially when we seem to come in contact or when we when we perceive a conflict between things that we believe or, or kind of have instinctually thought or things that we have assented to and sources of religious truth, like if you if you sort of say, well, why does the Catholic Church teach what it teaches about X, Mary or birth control or whatever? I don't really believe that, but I'm a Catholic or but I, I it seems like, you know, this is the kind of thing that comes up when people convert. I really love Catholicism, except for these like three things that are really hard and I can't commit. I can't, you know, I can't check the box because of these things. 
in my mind, I think that's where you don't you don't necessarily you, Newman wouldn't say, well, you should just make an ascent that in some ways violates your conscience. You just sort of force yourself to ascent, even though you don't. And that that doesn't make sense. I think what Newman would say is that you should be, you should kind of be open to the source, be open to the sources of truth that you're beginning to perceive or that you've already perceived to be trustworthy. Be open to them and be open, be kind of teachable to them. Be open to learning their reasoning, learning to think in line with them. In other words, want to believe, <laughs> right? Um, there's the famous phrase from scripture. I think it's one of the centurions who comes to Jesus in one of the gospels who says, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief, right? There's a way in which Newman would say, if you can't assent, or if there seems to be a situation where your assent and religious authority are coming into conflict, continue to purify, to work to purify your heart and your affections, your prejudices, and continue to, to kind of think and reason so that the two of those can eventually align. I hope that answers your question and then some. Um, yes. other, other questions? All right, great. Well, thank you so very much. Again, I apologize that I can't be there in person, but I'm really grateful that uh, that uh, you that we were able to do this, and and that uh, a number of you were able to be here. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Peters. All right. <laughs>